Hello and welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast. Now, it's just possible you're expecting Maddie Moat to be doing this intro, but alas, I'm afraid it's just old Robert, old Bobby Lou doing it instead. Now, this is uh, Maddie's very busy. Maddie sends her apologies. She wanted to do the intro for the live talk that she presented, but it, she is actually moving house today and is a bit preoccupied with boxes, carpets and bin bags full of clothes. You know how it is. Just chuck everything in a box, stick it in the back of it. Anyway, we've all been there. Uh, Now, this talk took place at Fully Charged Live, and in it, Maddie explores the topic of how to have a fully charged career. With this being school results time, we thought it was a very good time for all those wonderful young folks with the world at their feet, you know, huge opportunities in front of them, uh, to potentially think about a career within new energy and sustainability because it's a growth industry. If you've got any skills in chemical engineering, engineering, any interest in the energy industry at all, let alone electric cars, the, you know, the world is at your feet. The demand for people in that, uh, in that area is huge. So with this in mind, Maddie talks to David Hunt from Hyperion, Melanie Shufflebotham from ZapMap, and lastly, and it had to be drafted in the last minute, and Maddie will reveal why shortly, Chris Chapman from My Energy. Enjoy. started so this last panel if you've just joined us um, thank you very much we're going to be talking about how to have a fully charged career and we've got a great lineup of pal- uh, panelists um, would you like to all introduce yourselves actually and maybe give everyone um, I guess your elevator pitch what is it that you do and um, what what perspective are you bringing to this particular panel I'm David Hunt I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Hyperion Executive Search and we head on purely in the clean tech sector a uh, significant amount of that is in e-mobility, energy storage, solar, clean energy, um, internationally, of, including the UK, of course. Hello, I'm Melanie Shufflebotham. I'm the co-founder of ZapMap, an EV charging map. We've been going since about 2012 and recently got some investment from Good Energy. So we are increasing the size of our team from 6 to 12. So for us, it's, we're, we're in the middle of recruiting and building a team. And actually, I'm going to interrupt you just here because we were supposed to be hearing from Jordan Brompton from My Energy. I know there were some people who were coming specifically to hear her speak today. However, she went into labour last night and has had a baby. So, hooray! Um, Great news for Jordan. um, But it does mean that poor Chris has been dragged in at the very last minute. But actually, it's worked out well for us because the two of you are linked. So, Chris, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, we are indeed. I'm uh, four days into my my energy career, but I've just taken on the role as sales manager, uh, which David and his team at Hyperion, uh, they actually placed me into the role. So it works very well for today. And uh, I'm sure we're going to hear a bit more about that over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. I I think that's really interesting. So we've got both sides of the coin here. Um, But let's start. Actually, who here is already working in the clean energy sector? Okay. And who would like to be? All right, okay, so I think it's fair to say that the majority of people here are, are looking for some practical advice. Is that fair? Some practical advice to how you could perhaps move into this energy sector. Is that right? Yeah? We want advice. Okay, all right then. Um, let's imagine that I am writing my CV. I don't work in the clean sector at the moment, but I want to. What are the key things that I should be putting on that CV that is going to make a potential employer go, yes, this is someone that I can work with. Maybe we can hear that from everybody. Uh, Firstly, what I would say is um, people in the clean tech sector are generally recruiting very fast and they're very, very busy and don't have much time. So you have to draw the dots for them from your skill set to their needs. So when you read a job description or you see an advert, look very clearly at what the job entails. Look at your background and try and draw the... Uh, the the transferable skills out. Don't assume from your CV that the other person reading the CV will recognize that. So you have to be very obvious both in your CV and in your cover letter to explain. So for example, if it's a project manager's role in a a e-mobility company and you've been project management in oil and gas or in automotive, 
You don't have industry knowledge as such, but what you do have is project management skills. So make it very clear in terms of what you've done, how you've led projects, how you've been successful. So what I would say is you know, look at your experience, make it very obvious to the people you're applying to, to draw the dots between this is what I have done and this is why it's relevant and this is why I'll be able to do your job. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in a second actually. What about you, Melanie? Yes, I, I would say when we're recruiting, we have no expectation that anyone has any knowledge of or any experience in electric cars, because there's so, so few people who do. Um, we are looking for people who are bright, people who have a, a big passion for the industry and can demonstrate knowledge of that. Our, our main needs are in, in the area of our digital and software, so it's, it's not very specifically industry specific. So I would say bright, analytical people. There's lots of roles in, in clean energy. What about Chris? What about your experience? I mean, you've done it quite recently. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, extremely new into into the role. But as David said, the, the biggest thing for me was taking the areas that I've had in my previous career, not linked to the renewable energy sector, but in the automotive industry. And what I've found since actually being placed in the role and starting with my NG, discussing with the hiring managers, the, the areas that they were looking for wasn't the renewable energy sector experience, it was the other areas which they're missing, the, the, the processes, the sales management, etc. That's the areas that, that they wanted to be able to come in and utilize that experience that I've got and form it into the path of the renewable energy side and taking my energy sales path further forward in, in the future. So it, I could easily have been scared off from applying for that kind of role because it, it's not my uh, my history as such. But everybody needs sales process. Every, everybody uh, needs a certain level of structure to it. And it's just another industry. So actually all three of you have touched on this need for transferable skills, which actually suggests that at the moment, the talent pool uh, of people who have already got experience working in this sector is, is quite small. So you're having to look beyond it. Is, it, is, that, is that the case? Very much so. I mean, we as a company do very well from that small talent pool, but the, for the industry to grow, and it is growing exponentially, we need to have people coming into the business um, because A, there aren't enough people with specific industry experience, but also you actually bring in a new skill set, a new way of thinking, and new ideas, which is healthy for the sector as well. So there is definitely a, a, a lack of uh, talent in the sector um, and an opportunity for people to use those transferable skills, but it's not as easy as it should be. Do you have any other examples of... Um I mean, Chris, you're, sort of, you're, you're a great one, the fact you've come from the automotive industry, but have you met anybody that does not work in this area at all, but you've been able to spot those skills? Yeah, again, we're, in the US, we've got a, a client in energy storage, and we've actually placed somebody there who's a project manager in dirty oil and gas who'd seen the light and wanted to move. But, so their skill set was very different. Um, we've had in the UK also a company called Arenco, which is another energy storage developer based in London, and we placed a couple of people from there, one from... Um, uh, again, traditional gas trading, uh, and another from, I think, a software, um, uh, a sort of more traditional software environment. This is such a new industry that you've got startups popping up all the time. It does mean that if you are someone who is moving from quite a comfy job uh, from a, you know, within a very big company where you've got a very obvious ladder that you can climb, if you suddenly make that move, it's a bit of a leap of faith because you don't necessarily have that set up in these smaller companies. It, has that map done anything to sort of like fill people with confidence? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's very true. Working in a startup, you have to do everything. I mean, I think in, in, in a day, I have to write invoices. I have to tidy the office. I have to do some sales calls. I have to do a, a spec for some product development. And that goes throughout the company. So in a small company, you have to be ready to absorb a lot of information. You need to be ready to, yeah, be ready to take the opportunities as they come. And so you, you're a prime example of moving to a smaller company. What risks have you taken doing so? It depends how you want to view the risks, really. The biggest thing for me is you've got, you've got to be confident in your own abilities. If you're confident in your own abilities that you can transfer your skill set from one industry to another, there aren't necessarily that big a risks. Um, moving from an area where I spent 17 years in the automotive side and moving into re renewables, on paper it seems like a risk, but... The, the industry that I've now moved into is, is going to be so so big in the future. It, it's a calculated gamble as, as such. 
um, it's needed. It's, it's the way that the, uh, the automotive industry is going to go. So why not be on the good side of it? Yeah. So why, like, any other reasons why this is such a good sector to work in? I think we've all touched on when we were talking before, it's around passion. And yes. the reason that Fully Charged last year was crazy busy and it has been today and will be tomorrow is there are so many people who are um, inspired by the opportunity to do, to do something good. Um, and from a career perspective, you know, we all work a lot of hours. You might as well do something you're passionate about. Um, so what I would say is there, there are opportunities. It's not necessarily easy. In the great scheme of things, clean tech is still relatively small, but it is growing exponentially. But there is a huge opportunity to, to go and do something which is inspirational, which you enjoy, and obviously which you get paid for and pay the bills as well. As, it, as we're talking a lot about how it's very new here, how is someone who wants to get into the clean energy sector supposed to prepare or get themselves trained up for jobs that don't necessarily exist yet? Because that's the reality, that there's, this growth is happening all the time. Have you been employing people or creating jobs that are brand new? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think, well, I, yes and no. I think, I think a lot of the people that we need to, to build digital products are traditional software developers, however what they need, they need to understand all the terminology of the business and they need to have a creative mind because it's not, it, it, it's about bringing together energy, cars, digital data. So there's lots of different elements and it's certainly not just a, a straight path. And there's all those new user requirements that people didn't know about five years ago. So, yeah. Uh, in, uh, as a company uh, at Hyperion, in the last two years, we haven't placed one replacement role. So it's never been a case of Joe's left, can we find another Joe? Everything has been a new company, a new territory, a new product, a new area. So companies are making it up as they go along, which is a great opportunity. So there's challenges to that, of course, as well. But there's a great opportunity for that transference of skills. Um, but yeah, it, it, in terms of preparation, you touched on it there, about being nimble. We are all making it up as we go along on one hand. And within a startup in particular, you are doing multitasking. And not only what you start in the morning, you might be different by the afternoon. Companies have to pivot quite often in terms of their business models. So you have to be very flexible and very adaptable. And that can be a challenge for people from larger companies. Not always, of course. But it can be a challenge if you've been in a very structured environment. So what I would also say is it's great to want to get into a clean tech or into a startup in particular. But question yourself in terms of is that the best culture for you? Because um, it is challenging. There are difficulties. Um, but it does suit a lot of people. You say it can be tricky if you come from a company that does offer more structure um, and flexibility is important, but is it also necessary that these new startups, these smaller companies are putting training in place to help people with that transition? Is there anything that Zatmap do? Yes, I think, I think that's... I think that's very true. When we get our, our new people in, we have at least two weeks of induction where people have to understand the market, go and talk to all the different people in the company and, and, and outside the company. And I, I mean, I think there's definitely this, I, I've worked in the corporate sector as well as a startup, so there's definitely strengths and, and weaknesses of both. And actually what we've found is bringing in some people a bit more corporate, give a little bit more structure to our, um, you know, gives us a bit more structure, so that's good. So, so people from a structured environment can actually bring in a lot of good things to a startup, and especially when they're in a, in a growth phase. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, do you mind if I just... Yeah, go, yeah. The, the one thing I would say from, uh, from joining into the industry on a week or so ago, the amount of training I, I've had on, and hands-on experience is probably more than the last five years combined in the industry I've walked away from really? because of the passion of, of the people involved in my energy and what what they want and they deep, deeply believe in, in the products that they're selling in the sustainable energy future. I, they have given me so much more in five days than I, I, I took in years in my other industries because they care about it and the passion is obvious rather than just generic corporate, we best put you on some training because you're starting a new job. They actually want you to learn and love it. There's a challenge. We've got a, a company, a Dutch company called EV Box, and we were talking to the CEO recently saying that, you know, they've got people with six days experience being trained by people with six months experience. So the, you do have to be prepared that there is, I mean, it's a plus point, of course, but be prepared that there is an awful lot to learn and, and it's expected that you'll learn that very quickly. Yeah, but not only a lot to learn, a lot you've got to keep on learning because it carries on, it's, it's changing constantly. Yeah. Um, but also, so I think, it, I don't know if anybody was in Robert's uh, panel about solar and wind. I don't know if it was anyone in that. So, I've, I mean, I've just heard this on the grapevine, but apparently one of the discussions that was happening was that actually it's a lack of talent. It's a lack of people that is stopping the progression of 
the wind sector. Is that something we're seeing across the board? Um, it is, yeah. I mean, that's uh, we've. We place a lot of people from solar because in the great scheme of things, solar is actually well established. I got involved in solar in 2007, which is only nine, ten a year or so years ago. Uh, not good at math somewhere. That was <laughs> 11 years ago. Yeah. Time, time goes quickly. Um, but, you know, that's in clean, compared to e-mobility, for example, that's, you know, three or four times longer. So some old timers from solar we're placing into e-mobility. But across the board, it's absolutely true that a lot of startups, uh, and you'll echo this, you're growth potential is inhibited by the fact you have to have the right people in the right place doing the right thing. Was it, did you say at the moment you have seven staff? Is that right, Melanie? Yeah. Yes. Seven staff at the moment, and you're hoping to move that up to 12? Yeah. yeah. In, fact, in fact, we've identified two more, so we're just waiting for them to arrive. But So really nine, I guess. What have some of the biggest challenges been in getting to where you are right now already? Uh, in, in terms of recruiting? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd, I'd say that probably most, most people in, in the technology sector know how difficult it is to find fantastic software developers, and, and we're certainly finding that. We're, we're based in Bristol, which is a great tech sector, but there's a lot of demand for um, good software developers, so that's definitely been our, our biggest, biggest challenge, I would say. Is there any training available at all? Like, or is it all stuff that's going to have to happen on the job? Like, are there options for people who want to maybe like, for, like fill out their CVs a little bit? Anything you've come across? Not particularly. It's something I've been asked over many years, and some colleges do do solar courses and things, but then they're not actually very useful. Certainly no clients that I've ever worked with would seek or look specifically for a qualification in the sector. I mean, if, you're, if it's a technical role, of course, they might want you to have a, a computer sort of science degree or an electrical engineering degree, or, but that's a, that's a standard degree. I don't think there's any level of specialist. I mean, there are courses, of course, you know, in renewables, but they're not necessarily sought. What's sought is, is actually practical knowledge. You know, there's a level of technical knowledge depending on the level of the, the nature of the role, but generally it's around what can you do? What have you done before and what can you do for us and how quickly can you do it? So that pace is important. That, um, what, what I find quite exciting about so many of the companies that I've spoken to that are you know, represented at Fully Charged Live here is that they have actually, they've got an opportunity to reinvent the system, actually. And starting from the ground up, they can make their own decision about who's going to be you know, coming up with ideas, who they want sat around in the office. In terms of employing a diverse workforce, would you say that everyone, like, there's better representation within this industry at the moment in comparison to other tech fields? Um, I, mean, I mean, I think certainly at ZapMap, our, we've got a, a big aim to have a, a diverse workforce. I mean, I, I am a total believer that the more diversity you have, the better ideas you get and better atmosphere in the office, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, I think from our experience, there's uh, tech, automotive, uh, renewables, or maybe not so much renewable, but definitely tech and automotive and, and, and digital are quite male biased, so it's quite a challenge. So if there's any female software developers out there, please come and talk to me. <laughs> I think if you look at the industry as a whole, I think within uh, the energy sector broadly, there's 9% gender balance for females. And in clean energy, it's 17%. So you think, wow, that's double, which is good. But 17% is still a very low, still low level. Bad. And the automotive industry, likewise, as you'll testify, you know, generally, apart from perhaps showrooms, it is a very male-dominated area. Um, but going back to your point, this yeah. is an opportunity to readdress that. And we've got two or three clients who very specifically challenge us to have not just gender diversity, but a broader range of diversity into the businesses. As you say, it's hugely beneficial to a business to have diversity of thought, of opinion, and background, and experience. And there is an opportunity in clean tech, because broadly, we would like to think we're more liberal and open-minded. But importantly, we haven't got legacy issues to deal with. So you yeah. do have that opportunity to start from scratch. So yeah, if anyone's got any questions to ask the panel, please do put your hands up. Hi, hello. Um, hello. Would any of you consider hiring apprentices or doing anything alternative to like university degrees and stuff like that? Would that be something you would look for in an applicant or anything like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we've got some very specific roles, and but yes, we're open to apprenticeships and we, we've had apprentices in the past. Um, yeah, absolutely. Are apprenticeship schemes something that crop, crop up a lot? Like, are, are they out there? Are they available? I think they are. One of the challenges, certainly for larger organizations, because they tend to have those sort of things in place yeah. or, and, or, and are sort of equipped to address some of the um, bureaucracy around hiring apprentices, although it's much less so than it used to be. But 
I don't think there's any particular schemes or types of apprenticeships that certainly startups can or are, are, are prone to. Internships, for, you know, is something which a lot of people can use as a sort of well, try me for a month or two as a route. And if you're younger, uh, if you can afford to sort of spend one or two months on either minimum wage or even no wage, which I don't like to encourage, but you know, it's a route into the door. So that's a possibility. But there aren't sort of too many specific. Um, clean energy apprenticeships, yeah. apart from maybe sort of on the tools, blue collar work. But to me, that makes complete sense because if you can't, if you're not coming from an industry, if you're not coming from a role simply because those roles don't exist yet or there just aren't that many available, your only option to show willing and to, sh and to get any type of experience is to, is to intern because that will show passion as well on a CV, which is good for everybody. Okay, next question. I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. I'll go for this one. Yeah. So what, in practical terms, do we do to get the job? Because we know what we need to say to get the job, but how do we approach companies? You know, are there job expos, are there job markets? What's the best mechanism to get you know, that, uh, to approach companies in this sector? And as a small follow-up, would you classify middle-aged white males in the diversity category? I think first and foremost, pretty much any company in the sector will have on their website a list of jobs because everybody's looking. <laughs> it's a good place to start. I mean, there are job boards, but job boards I don't think are great um, for, uh, from either side of the equation. Um, there are, I, won't, I mean, there are trade shows like being here, for example, but there are lots of trade shows for clean energy, for e-mobility. The ones which are open to the public, it's always good to go because you're showing your interest. You'll probably get to engage with somebody who works for the company. Uh, and going back to your point, you can actually show willing and perhaps bypass uh, some of the sort of formal mechanisms. But what I would say is keep in, see the companies that are in the news. Uh, you know, just Google search companies. You, almost everybody will have jobs on their website. And the other question, which was a, which is a quick, quick follow-up, was do you find that companies or yourselves would positively discriminate? But I think you were saying that actually everybody wants to see a, a fair gender split but the best person gets a job. I think we may have spoken earlier about the... Oh, really? <laughs> oh, so, Cheeky. Uh, all right, then. The, one, of, one of the issues that across all recruiting, regardless of sector, is ageism. And it is very difficult once you get to 50. Um, more, much more so than, than gender or sexual orientation or other factors. Unfortunately, that's the case. Thank you. Um, I'm in the renewable in, uh, industry. I install heat pumps. We install heat pumps and renewable technologies. We have no problem with finding back office staff. It's quality engineers on the front line we struggle with. Less of a question. Did you hear that? Did you hear that question? That, that one? Yeah. So it's not so much of an issue. Thank you. Uh, not so much of an issue finding office staff, but actually it's tricky finding on the ground engineers. Is that something, that, are these transferable skills as well that would come from other industries? Would any of you feel? Yeah. I think generally, if, you know, as I say, we, we, our experience is mainly in more senior and executive levels and experience levels, but um, I think anyone who has, whether it's a mechanical engineer, going back to this point of need, if you can draw relevant experience, then there's, you've got a case to make because in the, you know, if you know something, you know more than people who know nothing. Um, so there is an opportunity, I think, for, if you, I don't know which angle you were coming from, whether you were recruiting or whether you were actually looking for, for a work. But yeah, I think definitely if you have some elements of skills that you can, going back to the early point, if you can draw some correlation between your experience or if you're recruiting, be more open-minded to think, well, what, what do I need to have my, my, this role do and what other backgrounds could be relevant to that? I think, sadly, that's probably one where you've got more information than we do. So if anyone does what, is interested in on-the-ground, hands-on engineering, maybe you're the person to have a discussion with, the, this gentleman in the cap at the front. Um, any more questions? Joe, behind you. How, how would somebody go about getting a job who's quite practical, um, but not fully ticketed up and very limited experience, but has a massive interest in the subject, in, in the job that they want to go for. I think you need to talk to this guy here, <laughs> because he's struggling to find people exactly like yourself. Well, I come from a background, I'm adaptable, I'm an ex-sound engineer. Yeah. This, this mic's awful. Yeah, hold it closer, yeah. Yeah. Right, I'm an ex-sound engineer, and I used to do uh, pubs and clubs. So, the sound engineer's motto is improvise, adapt and overcome. So, and I've got a lot of transferable skills that go in any trade. And from that, before that, I was a welder. After that, I'm an electrician. 
Right. And I'm now I teach, and I teach renewables. So when he says the teaching Wait. for renewables isn't that good, I, I beg to differ. Because a lot, a lot of the candidates that I went took away from it, because I've had practical on the knowledge, on the job right, skills. Yeah. Can, can I just ask, have you actually gone and looked for particular jobs? Is this something that you've, you've come up against? I, I have. I've, okay. I've found a lot of employers just won't employ me. Right. Uh, because they said, one of the comments I got was too, self, too self-taught. Uh, okay. Right. See, and now I, I, I don't go... know, I'm not an employer, so I think that if we move on for the question, I completely get what you're saying, it's a really frustrating situation to be in, but yeah. it seems bizarre to me that you wouldn't do a particular job. Um, okay. Dave, do you anything to comment? Well, before I started Hyperion for 10 years, I ran a, a re- renewable energy installation business in solar and small wind, uh, grew that to a team of 50 people. So we did, although they didn't directly report to me, but we did have people who were mostly you know, on the tools, literally. Um, but they were mostly either qualified electricians or apprentice electricians. So they didn't come with solar experience. And don't get me wrong, there were some colleges who taught decent levels of, of, of skills. What I mean is from companies don't necessarily look for that as you're finding. Just, just from my perspective as well, um, with, with my energy, I, I don't have a, uh, a skill set which is on paper in terms of a degree or anything like that. And the technicians that, that we've got in place as well, building the products that we've got, come from a very similar thing. It, it's what's in there rather than what's on a piece of paper. And my energy definitely are, are someone who will take someone on as long as, long as they've got a, a firm understanding as to what is needed, you can do a job. And I, I think from your experience, it's the employers who you're going to who probably don't deserve you as an employee anyway. Yeah, yeah, what well, he said. And before you leave, please, can you put your hands together for, we've got David, we've got Melanie, and we've got Chris. Thank you so much, honestly. Well, first of all, I would, all of us at Fully Charged would really like to pass on our heartfelt congratulations to our friend Jordan Brompton from My Energy and her partner for the safe arrival of beautiful baby Bonnie. I've seen a picture. She's absolutely gorgeous. Well, we hope you enjoyed this talk and hopefully those insider tips the panellists gave to help the next wave of talented youngsters try and build a world that's a little bit better than the one we're in now. To be perfectly honest, it's not that hard. Hopefully by now, some of you, particularly those of you who live in the United States of America, will have heard that we are coming to America. Yes, that's right. By massive popular demand, we are coming to the good old US of A. At the Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas, on the 1st and 2nd of February 2020, there will be fully charged live North America, filled to the brim with EVs and clean energy tech and really clever people giving talks and amazing things uh, on display there. We can't tell you everything yet because we're still arranging lots of things, but it's, I'm really impressed. We, and, and also just the people in Austin who we met uh, earlier this year, so supportive, really keen that we're doing it. It's a fantastic venue, amazing place. So tickets are actually on sale right now on our website, fullycharged.show, where you'll see uh, all the show notes and all the information we have about who's going to be there, tickets and all that stuff. And of course, our Patreon supporters get discounted ticket prices. And we've got a lot of wonderful Patreon supporters in the United States. And with this in mind, we just want to finally thank our wonderful patrons. You know, by now, you're utterly, insanely invaluable to us. We will never take you for granted. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely brilliant. So generous. So amazing. Long-term support. It's absolutely amazing. So if you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, follow the links in the show notes uh, accompanying this podcast and don't forget to leave us a five star rating and a review on your favorite podcast player as it does help us get discovered and gives us a sort of credibility and finally don't forget to subscribe to our two youtube channels obviously the main youtube channel which is storming ahead and uh, getting some great shows coming really exciting one coming this week uh, and also don't forget fully charged regen which has all these talks in audio visual form and lots of other bits and bobs as well so that's it as always if you have been thank you for listening <laughs> <laughs>